Hello everybody, it's Steve at the BIA. We'll be starting the webinar in one minute, one minute till we start. So hello everybody, it's Steve Bates and Nora Collister with the BIA's Brexit webinar for February 2019. Uh, 42 days till Brexit today, or 664 days till the end of the transition, if you do it like that. Uh, for the first time, uh, we'll make sure that this webinar is not only available um, uh, online for you to view uh, afterwards, but we're also going to try and turn it into a podcast. So if you're uh, fancy uh, updating yourselves whilst you're having a jog or in the car, um, we are going to try and put this into a podcast and that may be a format that works for you uh, going forward. What are we going to do today? Well, I hope we're going to give an update on uh, negotiations, what's gone on in uh, the UK, particularly in Parliament, uh, touch on the, U the EU position and then uh, give a BIA activity update. Um, we do these monthly and you'll probably remember this one from last time we updated uh, about the BIA Brexit website, amongst other things, uh, and uh, that's, they're available on YouTube if you're interested. The big news from us this month is that we have pulled together uh, in one location a new website, www.biabrexit.org, which has lots of Brexit publications for our sector, our public statements and documents, and uh, added bonus features for BIA members with presentations and members-only briefings. If you're uh, a member, you can log in uh, via our portal. So uh, I hope this is useful. Uh, it's had very good feedback. It's uh, uh, been soft launched over the last week and do please uh, visit it. Tell us what you think of it and I hope it's a useful resource for you uh, in between times. If there are things that are missing, uh, please holler and if there's links to things you think we, that uh, colleagues could benefit from, uh, that would also be useful to know. Now, uh, as you know, I always say, as we talk about Brexit, we're going to talk about some things that might not make us happy, but we should remember that the UK uh, biotech sector and life sciences sector goes into 2019 in a fantastic position, having raised a record amount of money from investors last year, uh, the largest of any European country, that we are a resilient entrepreneurial and resourceful ecosystem, that uh, Brexit led the UK government to invest more in its science infrastructure, and that we are working very, very hard to be ready for whatever outcomes uh, that, that may come. And we are uh, doing this from a position of strength where we are the third global cluster for life sciences, a leader in cell and gene therapy, genomics and AI, uh, with 5,600 companies generating more than £30 billion pounds worth of exports. And whenever you're talking about Brexit, I do encourage you to put the, the, this, this issue, which I'll now go into in some detail, in that context. Okay, so where are we? Uh, this week, we have seen the Parliament, uh, the Prime Minister defeated uh, for the 10th time, this Parliament, uh, on, uh, on Brexit, uh, and Conservative Brexiteers uh, were concerned that uh, by supporting the vote, they would be ruling out a prospect of no deal. It's an advisory vote, it's a non-binding vote, but, um, uh, but certainly is a blow to the Prime Minister. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I think has happened this week is we've seen increasing uh, chat from, uh, from within Parliament that... Uh, Perhaps centrist Labour MPs are thinking of splitting from the Labour leadership uh, once again. So those are the big changes this week. I think this is the central dilemma the Prime Minister faces. Um, she's either got to decide to do the column on the left or the column on the right. And it's very hard 
to do both and get right the support through Parliament for both for both of these. So on one side, um, she's keen to deliver the will of the people as expressed by the referendum and unite the Conservative Party. And in order to do that, she has to maintain the support of the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland, and get the European Research Group uh, of, uh, of Conservative MPs to back a revised deal by changing the backstop. And uh, some of the mood music that she's been articulating recently was that that's what she was endeavouring to do and is trying to do. And at the same time to do that, she needs to peel off Labour leave supporting MPs, uh, perhaps uh, to support the deal, either because they support Brexit or perhaps there's a, a sweetener in terms of something around uh, support for their constituencies in terms of uh, regeneration or perhaps in workers' rights terms. The other way that she can turn is to put the, the country uh, as a whole or the economy of the country as a whole uh, to, uh, first, Prevent, present a revised, perhaps softer deal uh, to Parliament, which would attract the support of enough Conservative moderates and enough Labour moderates that they would feel comfortable in supporting that. And that's certainly the position that I think we're seeing the EU encouraging the Prime Minister towards. Um, business, I think, uh, is keen that we avoid the economic shock of a crash out, no deal Brexit. But the political challenge for the Prime Minister is that this potentially splits not only her own party, but potentially uh, the Labour Party. And uh, that's perhaps a political uh, decision that's a very difficult one for any Prime Minister to take. And that's why I set it out like this, uh, along with my favourite Eurovision winner, uh, which is, of course, Bucks Fizz. Uh, it's time for the Prime Minister to make her mind up. Uh, and as, as she goes to church with her husband, as you can see here, uh, we know that she uh, is a regular attender at church. So she, as she prays in the, the short weeks ahead, I, I, I think that this is probably the, 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 the central dilemma she is caught with and the framing which I, I see this for. Now, for our sector, if there was to be a softer deal, uh, one thing that's interesting is if you look at the letter of exchanges that's gone between the Prime Minister May and the leader of the opposition, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, um, both of them agree that, uh, on medicines regulation, that there be uh, continued, uh, the, the exploration of continued close cooperation uh, by with the EU, uh, UK authorities with union agencies such as the European Medicines Agency. So if there was to be something that was softer, some of the elements of things that we've um, we've seen central to our sector are already included in the discussion that has been between them and they agree on this, which is just something to note uh, if that were to happen. I, we're at the stage now where uh, amendments to bills are very, very important in terms of the UK parliamentary arithmetic. Uh, and we've seen in a sense three series of these. We saw some at the end of January, uh, on the 29th of Jan, where there was a, a couple of, um, a series of votes, including one which we went into some detail last month about, about whether Parliament would take back control and rule out no deal by extending Article 50. Um, that was defeated in the House of Commons. Other amendments were also defeated, but there was a symbolic bill, uh, a symbolic amendment which suggested don't crash out without no deal was passed. What we saw yesterday, was the, the the vote with the government's uh, Brexit strategy, uh, continuing support for the government's Brexit strategy defeated in Parliament, but also the Labour and SNP's amendments to that were also defeated. And Anna Subri, who had put one up um, asking for more information uh, on the impact of no deal to be um, to be uh, published, uh, was withdrawn after the government agreed to, to do that. So I think, again, um, nothing absolutely uh, binding on the government yesterday and uh, as a result of this, kicking the can down the road until probably week beginning of the 25th, probably the 27th of February is the next opportunity to be for members to be voted on. And I think what's interesting is some of the ideas that we saw defeated um, before may may come back uh, if there is no progress on a deal. So could a bowls Cooper Parliament takes back control amendment uh, to rule out no deal come back? I think that is a probability. I don't say it is anything higher than that, but um, some of this um, is an elegant dance, which we may see uh, returning to some of the, the themes that we've seen before. For more details on that, do look at the last last webinar if you're interested. But I just think we're heading towards uh, more votes on the 26th, 27th. We may get more amendments and we may get uh, more from Yvette Cooper uh, in line with the stuff that we thought had gone away. Um, uh, and who knows, but uh, planning towards the 27th. Now, this is a lovely, lovely, uh, simple uh, roadmap for you. We've given them to you before and we found one from Gatehouse Advisory Partners. So thank you, Gatehouse, for 
this one um, it is in great detail as a flowchart and you can take the 14th of February meaningful vote in the top left hand corner uh, out of this picture and put in the 26th 27th of February meaningful vote and it still op operates and the idea is it um, gives the various routes by which uh, the UK Parliament could end up with either an exit with a deal an exit with a deal uh, later no deal in March or no deal later or continued EU membership and at the moment um, this uh, August uh, advisory agency have uh, deal exit at 51%, no deal exit at 26%, and EU membership beyond June at 23%. So um, uh, you pay your money and you take your choice uh, with these these elements. I think uh, we've always said you know it's hard to rule out the options. The options depend on uh, on on the politics. I think we've given you uh, some senses to the the politics that are that are running there. Um, which way uh, we go through this uh, flow chart, uh, I don't know, uh, but I think uh, we're really in a, a holding pattern until there are more meaningful votes in the UK Parliament, which we expect uh, the week after next. Um, that's, I think, where we're at. But I'm going to ask Laura to take us through some of the, the detail that's gone on, which is important for our sector uh, in Parliament uh, in the last couple of weeks. Laura. So one of the things that we've been talking about recently is the PAC parliamentary calendar. This came up when um, we were doing some work around um, a recent SI um, in IP um, and we were highlighting how there are so many um, no deal SIs that need to go through Parliament and so many being developed, many of them without significant consultation um, in the usual way that stakeholder consultation would be expected for significant pieces um, of policy that will impact the sector. Um, whilst much of the work, um, the intention of these SIs is to fix any issues with the current situation, therefore they do not take account of the future, they are sort of, what we're finding is they're sending strong signals internationally around what potentially could be the UK's future approach to certain things, but those approaches haven't been taken into account when drafting the SIs and obviously stakeholders haven't been able to um, fully engage in those. Um, the diagram on the right hand side was from the government's legislation.gov.uk um, site this morning, that's the number of SIs that have been tabled. Um, have been laid, so 222 at um, about 10 o'clock this morning had been tabled, had been laid this year, um, just in just this year. Um, so that's in a, in a month and a half, you've had more than the entire amount that were in 2016 or 2017, and you think by the end of next week we'll have got beyond the numbers for 2018? Yes, yeah. <laughs> I think it was about 15 yesterday looking at it. Um, Equally, if there is a deal, there's also a number of bills that need to get through Parliament to um, address any fixes there. So whilst um, Parliament is concentrating on the no deal SIs, if there is a deal, they will very quickly have to get finalised seven bills that need to finish their parliamentary passage, also all before the 29th of March. And bearing in mind um, a meaningful vote isn't expected for a few weeks, it also would need to be approved um, by the European Parliament. The next European Council is on the 21st and 22nd of March, and that might, um, if there is a deal, be the date of the final confirmation, which would then give a week for the seven bills to be finalised. Um, I mentioned um, the SPC's SI um, around IP. We talked about this last time. Um, BI had submitted um, a briefing um, to the House of Lords, which um, Lord Warner took up on our behalf around um, a specific issue which um, linked um, the date of a law authorization in the EA. Um, sorry, it linked whether you launch your, the date of whether you launch in the UK or you, EU with um, when your IP um, might start and therefore would have an impact on your SPC. This was originally negative in the House of Lords um, because of my, there was a long discussion around lack of consultation um, and also um, potential impact on the sector. So we had highlighted um, the long-term global reputation of the sector and how anything that might potentially show that IP in the UK may not be um, fully protected will have um, 
future implications um, on where companies might want to base global um, investment. Um, it has now passed through the House of Lords, but in the, when it returned there, the minister did make commitments to looking at future options. He did make commitments around review and therefore BIA will be following up with those. Um, there are also more um, SIs that have been laid before Parliament since um, the last webinar. Serious shortages protocols have been laid. We had we ran through that at the last one. That is around um, substitution um, if there are shortages. Um, the three ones which are key for are for regulation in terms of medicines, clinical trials, and medical devices have also been laid. Um, but one of the things we just wanted to touch on. Um, is um, around the draft impact assessment. So the picture at the bottom is from the legislation.gov.uk site. You'll see there's a tab which says draft impact assessments. Within that is the impact assessment. And um, I've taken some bits directly from it just to highlight um, where we might consider that there are some issues. So whilst um, regulatory colleagues have looked at the SIs and they are as expected, there are they believe there are no surprises and therefore that it is as expected quite clearly some of the statements included in the draft impact assessment shows that there will be an impact on industry um, sort of slightly linked to um, what we're mentioning what I just mentioned around the SBC's SI and linking launch um, data authorization in UK or EU and data and market exclusivity whichever is Earlier, um, the impact assessment directly says it's been adopted to encourage companies to submit applications for instant products to the UK as soon as possible. There'll be no additional cost unless individual bus businesses decide to delay their marketing authorizations. Um, this is an area that we are concerned around as our members are saying to us that um, whilst we can see why government might do that in reality, that is not how they would act and therefore it's actually showing quite a sort of um, companies are concerned of the impression it gives around the UK and it is having an impact on where they would decide where the UK falls within the launch markets. Um, other things that I've highlighted around cost to industry, additional direct cost to industry, additional administrat administrative cost to industry, and so quite clearly um, in the impact assessment, there are quite a few costs to industry in terms of the clinical trials. Um, it talks about a cost of to clinical trial sponsors. Um, and then um, it also talks around duplicating in terms of medical <coughs> pricing and trade effects, duplicating regulatory processes um, and how that might lead to extra costs which might also lead to um, price increases, which could affect NHS budgeting and spending choices. Um, we will also see that um, in terms of public health, um, they highlighted um, the, the draft impact assessment highlights some work that was done by the Office of Health Economics and was commissioned by BIA and ABPI, which looked at um, the impact of how, um, impact of, um, access to medicines for um, in the UK so would um, how would companies launch their products so it's sort of saying is that um, many submissions to the EMA when compared to Canada Switzerland and Australia were not made um, this report is available on the OHE website if you want some more detail but it did highlight just some of the top line stuff and showing the numbers of um, submissions which weren't made to the regulators in those countries. Thanks, Laura. I think what you can see from, from that, and it's excellent work by, by the team to dig out the explanatory notes to a detailed SI when we've got hundreds of them coming through at the same time, is it shows that there is an understanding from government and government is laying before parliament the duplicative nature of the proposals they're putting down in terms of regulation so they're accepting that this is a additional level of red tape that this is expensive uh, and will produce, to, can lead to more costs and will impact, impact patients and the nhs so um in one response level i think we can be we can be pleased to see that uh, that our analysis is not very far away from the government's own analysis of uh, of this um and uh 
uh, and in normal times, perhaps a bill that was put forward uh, with these types of things would attract scrutiny from conservative members concerned about costs of business or um, others who would see uh, uh, NHS minded Labour MPs who would be interested in the fact that this was deleterious to NHS outcomes. But we're seeing this happening under a deluge of or a focus on um, the political knockabout for for, um, uh, for for Brexit in general. And I think, as always, the devil is in the detail. But I think that these um, these explanatory notes on the SIs do show that the real picture that we would be facing in the no deal. Um, I think that uh, our ask of government is to, uh, if these were ever to come to pass, that we would need to review them in light of both the specifics and the generality of this. Um, and I, I do leave it with everybody that there is a great deal of detail now in the public domain from government, which shows that they are both suggesting expensive duplicative red tape uh, and, uh, and an impact for NHS patients as a result of the, type of the secondary legislation they are proposing to the Houses of, uh, of Parliament. So we are really in a, a world upside down uh, position. I think if you look at, um, uh, at medicines contingency and planning for this, this is sort of where the, the headlines are being taken in our sector about uh, no deal planning. And you can see that this is a constant refrain now within uh, within the political discourse. We're seeing um, the, the prime minister being asked about it at uh, PMQs. Uh, we've seen uh, Matt Hancock, health, Secret health secretary, being asked about this uh, recently at the Health Select Committee and Simon Stevens as well. Um, uh, Dame Sally Davis, the chief medical officer, was asked about it on the radio uh, and, uh, uh, and the chief pharmacist, Keith Ridge, is also on the record. So what we've done here, thanks, Laura, is pull together some of the, the thoughts that have, um, uh, that have been uh, articulated by, by the government. Um, uh, I think it's important to point out that Keith Ridge is, is, uh, has mentioned that um, investigational medicinal products using clinical trials will be included in the additional transport capacity that's being uh, set up. Um, Sally Davis is fairly open there about uh, we may be able to get them in. A lot of work is going on, but we don't know whether we'll have shortages of common drugs or drugs that are used only a little. Um, and uh, these are, you know, uh, are the realities of, of, of where the contingency discussion uh, is. Um, I think on the uh, uh, on the um, transport uh, that's being put together. Uh, you can see that there's public, lead, public domain information about additional roll-on, roll-off ferries uh, and, uh, and, uh, and talk of, uh, of, of, of aeroplanes. Um, and I think uh, the main thing that's happened here is that there was a plan to have a contract with a company called Seaborne that the government had cancelled. That wasn't really planned into the medicines contingency thinking um, which was fortunate as they've no, not been able to deliver uh, and that has uh, gone by the by. And I think with regard to this, our response really remains the same as it has done for the last uh, month or so. Uh, uh, did no, disorder, no deal disorderly Brexit, Brexit must be avoided to stop the negative impact on patients, public health and the sector. Time is running out uh, and uh, and. Uh, we call on the government to rule out a no deal Brexit, uh, in part because of the complexities of uh, the um, supply chain, in part because uh, we don't believe that there is parliamentary time to secure uh, the necessary legislation uh, and, uh, and we're just not confident uh, in the uh, overall perspective of, uh, of the government with regard to this for or uh, the complexity of our supply chains and patient safety procedures. Um, so just a couple of um, reminders here. So um, all marketing authorisation holders would have received a letter from the MHRA about grandfathering, centralised marketing authorisations. Um, they had asked for responses by the end of the month. If you haven't responded, um, they would be grateful if you would. And they have also asked, even if you aren't in position to respond in full, to respond and make contact. If you haven't had the letter, um, please let um, our colleague Christiane know and she will contact the MHRI team on your behalf and put you in contact. Um, the other um, 
reminder. Um, so this is from the last um, webinar. Department of Health are doing some work around no deal planning on clinical trials and have reached out to clinical trial sponsors um, with survey. Um, again, if you haven't had it, um, please could you contact this email address at DHSC um, as they're um, trying to do their planning. They'd be very grateful for engagement from companies. Um, just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that we've spotted recently. So um, Politico have um, been speaking to um, one of CI UK's um, leaders of the clinical trials unit around some of the Brexit impact, um, and they highlighted how preparation for Brexit is impacting um, their clinical trials in terms of um, having to slow work to prepare for no deal, the cost of um, changing contracts, um, appointing legal representatives, etc. Um, and that in a no deal, they might need to spend recruitment into those trials. Um, there is obviously more detail in the political article. Another one we'd seen is an interview this week with Pharma Forum with Ipsen CEO, who talked about how they would prioritise um, FDA and the EMA, and then look at other major markets like um, Japan and um, then China, and then in the future, the UK would be markets with would then follow those markets um, along with Switzerland, Canada, on Australia. Um, and those are the three countries which were looked at in the OHE report, which was referenced in the draft impact assessment, which we've just run through. So Laura, you get to do the good news slide next. So um, one of the things that we've been asking government for quite a long time, because members have been saying that it's really important to how they do their business was um, the grandfathering of the UK-US um, mutual recognition agreement, and that came out yesterday. Um, I think also signed this week was the UK-Switzerland trade continuity agreement. Um, so obviously, I think um, we had been asking for all the EU agreement, MRAs and FTAs to be grandfathered, um, in particular anything with the US and other key markets. So it's good to see some movement, if not all of them, and also um, the response from Department for International Trade of focusing on what businesses are saying really matters in terms of the grandfathering um, as opposed to um, the new um, agreements. Yeah, I, I think this is really important. I mean, if you look at uh, US, UK trade by value, uh, I think uh, pharmaceuticals and similar make up about 18% of UK to US trade. So for our sector, this is really, really significant and it's really important that we've got this. So as a key piece of the no deal planning, it's good to see that this is over the line and enables companies to have confidence that all relevant aspects of the EU, US MRA um, will continue to be um, uh, operated in a UK, US environment if there is a no deal Brexit. So I think it is very important that people know that. However, if you think about no deal and trade continuity, uh, and this was a leaked snap that was seen as to whether the Department of Trade, in, uh, Department of International Trade was on track to deliver the 40 or so trade deals that it said it would be confidently ready to go on the day after Brexit. Uh, you can see that their internal analysis of their own thinking is not uh, that that is on track. Uh, they have done some deals um, uh, uh, with uh, Eastern and Southeastern Africa, the Faroe Islands. Um, uh, I believe the Switzerland one is very close, or maybe have done this week. But you can see on many of the, the other ones, delivery on by March 29 significantly off track includes places like Egypt, Albania, Macedonia, Lebanon, Serbia, Tunisia, Ukraine, and not possible to be completed by March 2019, Turkey, Japan, people like that. So um, I don't think that we should take the um, uh, the great news about the US uh, deal on uh, on um, uh, on conformity to be a harbinger that everything will appear in the next couple of weeks on full trade deals. I'm going to remind you now of a couple of bits of things that we said uh, last time around, which I still think think hold. So this is from January. Uh, what was going to happen? Was it going to be a deal, no deal, crash out, delay, or doesn't happen? And, I, and I, my analysis hasn't really changed in a in a month. I think it's still unlikely that there will be a, a deal 
uh, voted on in time for, 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 for March. We might get there, but I think it's unlikely. I also think it's unlikely that there'll be a no deal crash out. Um, it is possible, things uh, without, without a change of direction. That could happen, but I think it's unlikely. I still think that we will see uh, before the end of March an extension or a delay to, uh, uh, to, to Brexit. Uh, and I think that will either be because uh, there is the mo mooted an idea of a deal or a, de a, a talks to get to a deal um, uh, and that that needs a bit more time, that there could be uh, a, 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 a dissolution of Parliament or Parliament uh, falling apart, but asking for time to reform itself either as a general election or uh, in, a, in, a, just, uh, in the realms of possibility but not probability, a second referendum. And there's a chance that um, Brexit uh, doesn't happen at all. And that's also unlikely. So I still remain of the four big buckets. I'm still, I think it's going to get kicked down the, the road. Um, last time we said uh, any deal will be driven by a crisis at the 11th hour and the 11th minute. I still think that's that's valuable. Um, and and uh, although we keep trying hard, you can see that the vast majority of the discussion in Parliament is not focused on the things that matter to uh, our sector, our industry. They are, are focused on the backstop. They are focused on internal politics in their own parties, um, not um, uh, not things that we 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 would uh, care about. And I still think. Parliament, we have to remember that Parliament is sovereign. Erskine May is the rules by which Parliament operates, and the Prime Minister is captured in a in a Parliament, UK Parliament that is very difficult to control. She doesn't have a clear majority. Is working still with um, with a deal with the Democratic Unionists of Northern Ireland, and that's why I think things could just uh, continue to be thrown up as we've seen in terms of a sort of rolling political crisis with some odd things happening, uh, and uh, and they probably could continue to do so. I don't. Don't think my analysis here has changed dramatically. What are the dates to look out for going forward? Well, um, it's a couple of weeks away. They were going to go on half term uh, next week, Laura, but they've been held back to do important business, which we are unyet sure of in the UK Parliament as to what they're actually doing. But there's lots of SIs to get through, not all from our sector. But we think that there could be a vote and amendments back in Parliament um, the sort of Tuesday, Wednesday of the week after next. Um, the last European Council, where there will be the chance for a formal discussion is the 21st and 22nd of March before the Brexit date, one week before Brexit. And <clears throat> there is talk that that becomes the, the crunch moment for a final deal or whatever. It really is uh, very, very late. But you could see that um, working on analysis, we've seen that that might be the deadline against which um, if you want to hold everybody hostage, uh, the politicians could choose to do so. Uh, 29th is the exit deadline day. And then we go into uh, into into recess. Um, I've also been over to uh, our colleagues in uh, Europa Bio, so taking a, a view on Brexit, perhaps away from from a London, but from a from a Brussels or an EU perspective. I think uh, they're still waiting clarification as to what London is interested in and what it wants to do. Does it want to do a deal on the basis it's discuss discussed, or does it want to do something else? Uh, there is continued discussion on border reassurance, but it doesn't seem that that's going very well. How how the backstop could be revised. Um, how uh, side letters could be added, um, all of those types of things. I talked to the top of the shop about um, uh, whether the EU would actually quite like to see a stable consensus in government uh, or in the UK Parliament uh, emerge. And uh, and that's, I think, why we've seen Donald Tusk talk about Labour proposals, which could bring together, a, if, if the government were to back them from the Conservative side, um, a solid um, majority in Parliament. But um, I think the EU are keener on that. But... Um, we're not seeing that emerge from the UK Parliament. Brexit Day is now imminently is 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 imminent upon us, and we're starting to see some voices from individual countries um, talking slightly different position rather than simply waiting behind the Barnier community um, voice. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn goes to Brussels, and we'll see whether that makes a big difference. Our friends at the European Medicines Agency, unfortunately, have lowered their flag in London. Um, uh, a very sad picture from us uh, in the UK here uh, on the top right, uh, but they've also provided uh, detail uh, in terms of a Q&A uh, on how they intend to operate. And there are some new documents here, uh, which I would encourage uh, those who are in involved in medicines regulation to make sure they have seen, looked at and um, uh, and 
and and and, and use. Um, so more detail from them on these details. Uh, but the sad thing is the flags have come down. We're starting to see uh, uh, other European uh, countries uh, talk about and think about um, what they would do in terms of medicine supply if there was to be a no deal, whether that be Netherlands, Ireland, Malta, Germany. Um, and I think we will, we may see some more of this as, um, as no deal uh, looms more closely in the next few weeks. And of course, uh, Brexit is perceived as a big blue monster in Holland. Uh, jobs uh, are moving. Uh, we've seen the discussion around uh, the um, uh, falsified medicines directive coming into 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 be, and uh, we're seeing uh, lots of discussion of this, uh, which we watch with interest. Laura, why don't you tell us what we're doing from the VIA? So. Um We'll carry on doing quite a lot of parliamentary briefings as the SIs of direct relevance to the sector um, go through um, their processes. Um, we've done some work around um, the SBC SI. We will do um, some work around the medicines um, SIs as they um, and clinical trials ones as they come um, to Parliament. Um, we had a EU relationship ministerial meeting um, and then we have another one coming up. Um, they're very regular. They always deliver lots of actions and so they require lots of follow up work. We had a first meeting of a potential BIA trade group um, yesterday. So we did some scoping out of what potential issues it would cover. We had a good discussion yesterday working out where, what is best for BIA to deliver value to members in those areas. And we'll be doing further work around that and uh, be pleased to hear from members that might be interested in taking some of that forward and being part of that. Um, of course, the BIA Brexit website has gone live um, and um, that will continue, we'll continue to update that, but it has a lot of information on it already. Um, we talked about, I've mentioned the SIs, um, we are, BI continues to input into the Government Medicine Supply Contingency Planning Programme, both in terms of content and um, communications, um, and we have a Brexit Lead Network coming up on the 25th. Um, when we get to the Brexit Lead Network slides, we have the dates for the rest of the year on that, just to flag, um, might be worth putting in the diary. Did we mention the Brexit website, Laura? <laughs> it's fantastic. And there'll be a prize for anybody who can give me the best caption for this fantastic visual, which not only combines the EU flag, the UK flag, but also some molecules, which is really a fantastic way of badging uh, the life science industry in uh, Brexit. And if you've got any um, feedback, um, uh, Jack would very much like to hear it, hear from you at Jack Fellows at industry, bioindustry.org about it. We are investing quite a lot of time and effort on it, so we hope it's a useful resource. Please do give us some feedback. Laura mentioned that we not only get you together uh, vir virtually, but we do do it face to face and give you some crumbly sandwiches at uh, the BIA ABPI Brexit Lead Network, certainly bad coffee, uh, will be available on the 25th of February, uh, alongside some fantastic updates from uh, key people in government who are engaged in this and the chance to engage. So do register if you're a member there. Uh, you said uh, that we had the dates for the rest of the year. Uh, I know I said that Brexit might be delayed, but we are. Um, don't don't take it by the fact I've put we put the date in on the 17th of December that we think we'll be talking about the same things then. But we did think it was useful to say 9th of April, 23rd of July, 16th of September, and 17th of December. That'll be the Christmas party one. Um, we we'll, we we'll, are in the diary, and uh, even if we're into a negotiation of a of a deal or operating in a new no deal environment, I believe there'll be value for members coming together, and those are the dates. So, what's happened? The Conservative consensus of two weeks ago is broken because Theresa May couldn't win in Parliament yesterday. Time is running out. Parliament hasn't got enough time to get their legislation through. And who knows what will happen? Look at Parliament uh, continuing to matter whilst no deal preparations continue. Uh, tune in in the next couple of weeks to see what happens on the 27th. Of course, uh, if you're a regular followers of us, you'll know that our position remains the same and it has done for many, 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 many months. Uh, this is uh, what we are keen to see, uh, both in terms of regulation and trade, movement of people, R&D and funding. Um, we uh, continue to make the same case, uh, but you can see that that's 
not necessarily borne out in some of the legislation we are seeing in terms of the SIs. But please remember, and if you're talking about Brexit globally or with your global colleagues, uh, we do this from a position of strength. We are a fantastic uh, ecosystem. We've got great science, great people, great talent, decent funding. Um, and uh, much of this is not uh, directly impacted by that which we've talked about before. It's the uh, if people's uh, science in their labs is not uh, uh, is not directly affected by much of this, we'll continue to keep going on these things. And 5,600 companies generating more than 30 billion in exports uh, is the beating heart of our community. Will continue to be so. With that, I'm going to say, remind you we've got uh, a few questions. If anybody has got any questions on these things, we will happily endeavour to answer them. So a couple of questions about um, uh, the WTO. Uh, could the uh, could other countries uh, prevent the UK from accessing WTO moving forward? Uh, I don't think that. Uh, uh, so my understanding of the WTO is that um, the UK remains a member, but. Uh, the ability for some of the individual parts that are agreed under the WTO uh, have to be re-agreed when the UK joins in its own right rather than uh, through the EU. And at that point, there is the opportunity for other members of the WTO to raise a hand or a flag. And we have seen that with regard to some of the uh, some of the suggestions around intellectual property. Laura, help me out here with the government procurement agreements. That's right. So, uh, so I think the answer is falling back on WTO terms is not as straightforward as people might have you think. There is many points of negotiation where others may choose to raise a hand or intervene. And the example that we have seen on that at the moment is how government procurement contracts work, which has been uh, uh, concerned by New Zealand, Moldova and a couple of others. Uh, so uh, we're not doing a lot of work on this at the moment, but um, we're certainly not assuming that things like uh, zero, zero, zero for zero pharma tariffs are automatically going to be um, turned over, rolled over automatically. There may be a process. It may not be a process that's difficult, but it is certainly a process in which there could be theoretical hurdles. We've not we've not seen any practical hurdles or key things in our sector yet. We are alive to it. We have um, a line of sight to the UK representation in Geneva that look at many of these things, but it's not something that we have had front and centre. Any other questions? And thank you for those who are uh, providing us with some thinking as to where we could check out um, WTO uh, matters. Uh, on sides, you mentioned the European Medicines Verification System. Would investment in this system by companies in the UK be lost in a no-deal Brexit scenario? Could technology be repurposed for the use in a standalone UK verification system? Um, great question. Uh, I, I think um, this will depend a little on uh, database uh, compatibility. Um, it's not an area that I've done lots of work on this is around falsified medicines direct directive and the implementation of of that of that work um which is coming to force in the uk uh, but is at risk if there is a no deal brexit in a few weeks time uh my sense is that uh, the sensible way forward would be to for everybody to try and work to see how that uh, technology that's been uh, many millions of pounds and many years of work has been sunk into could be um, used most effectively for patient safety i'm sure that's both how uh, regulators and um, market participants, uh, pharmacists, drug companies and others would would seek to approach it. But I don't think we've done any uh, any real thinking on that uh, as yet. And it's one of the, the unknowns that uh, is in the um, in the difficult box of the the no deal Brexit at the moment. I think we've kept you for 45 minutes. Uh, I'm going to uh, thank you for your attendance, uh, encourage you to Think about coming to some of the upcoming uh, BIA events, potentially if you're in Scotland uh, this month, we'd love to see you at the uh, networking lunch there.
Uh, Women in Biotech is uh, with us on the 7th of, of March, and we're in Cambridge on the 13th of March, as well as uh, London on April the 11th. Uh, some other dates for your diary there. Thank you very much for your time. If you're not a member, do consider joining. John Cudlick would love to hear from you, jcudlick at bioindustry.org. And with that, thank you very much. We are taking bookings for February the 22nd uh, next time round. And I'd like to thank Rapinda, uh, who leaves us today for her help in making sure that we've um, uh, kept this March on. March the 22nd, sorry. March the 22nd, <laughs> March 22nd next time round. Many thanks and thank you all.